All right, it says it started. Yep. Excellent. Hi, everyone. So today it's the TAC meeting, July 11th. We have a quorum of members here. I'll just do a roll call just so that Amber will have it for her notes and Amber's about to sign off. So Please and thank you. <laughs> Tra Tracy is here and does everybody else want to weigh in? Chris. Kim Tremblay. Joe Fatarusa. All right. And we are also joined by Jason Skills and the town manager, Paul Bachman. So um, I will just read the quick little language about remote meetings. It says, pursuant to chapter 20 of the acts of 2021, and extended by chapter 22 of the acts of 2022, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time. So um, typically, if we do have attendees in the meeting, we allow them to con come in as panelists, similar to what we would do if we were meeting in person. Um, we don't have anybody in the waiting room today, so, okay. All right, so um, it sounds like that we are going to go ahead and talk about the West Street improvements first. Um, and Jason Skills is here and he can summarize those for us and we can ask questions, give some feedback. Um, TSO did ask for our feedback prior to the next meeting, though maybe that's changed now that they're not discussing transportation at that meeting. Um, and then after that, we'll move on to talk to the town manager about the transportation commission charge. So, all right, Jason. Okay, I'm, uh, I'm going to share my screen and I'll share the plans that were included in the bid package. Um, let's share screen. There it is. Uh, let's see. There it is. <coughs> Can everybody see West Street Roadway widening and bus pull offs? Yes. Okay. So just for location sakes, it's, it's on a little section of West Street. Let me see. Oh, can I just not zoom in? Here we go. It's on. Oops. Tiny little section of West Street between. Oh, come on. Stop. It's jumping around on me. Sorry about that. Um, there we go. No. So between Potwine Lane and Long Meadow Drive, there's an existing bus pull off over there, but there's not, there's only sidewalk on one side. It's kind of has some conflicts with the entrance to uh, Potwine Lane. Here, I'll go to existing conditions sheet. This is the existing conditions sheet here. And so the existing, it's hard to see, I apologize. The black and white is really grayed out. So the northbound pull-off is right here, just after Popwine Lane. And it's barely a pull-off. It's basically a breakdown lane. Um, it doesn't provide a whole lot of space. It's maybe a little bit more than just bike lane, but, but not much. And the southbound bus pull-off is directly across from Popwine Lane. There is existing sidewalk on this west side of the street from all the way from Long Meadow all the way down to Hampshire College. But there's no sidewalk on the Popwine side. And so depending on where you're coming from and going to, you have to make a slightly risky cross to get over to one bus stop. Or if you get dropped off on one side, you're crossing without a crosswalk to get to the other side. So we had, you know, just a couple of resident complaints that sort of that, you know, honed us in on this and, and PBTA also kind of pointed to it and said, hey, can you guys help us out with a, you know, a solution for this problem? So so we started looking at it and uh, started uh, started playing with a whole bunch of different options. And I think what we ended up with is uh, it's a pretty good compromise of. Uh, best case scenarios and where it fits and where the grading works the best. And we also had to maneuver around utility poles. Uh, Eversource was very helpful in removing uh, one of the, or they haven't done it yet, but they will be removing one of the utility poles. And uh, Barry Roberts, who owns the former Camel Hassan's furniture store, which is now a veterinary clinic, um, was also very cooperative in allowing us to help because the, the the service, his power service, comes off the pole we want to remove. So between Eversource and Barry Roberts, it worked out really nice to to figure out um, how to how to move the pole, how to reconfigure everything, and and where to find 
the best place for a new bus pull off. So this is actually, I might just go to the rendering. Um, where do I, I'm going to just, yeah, I'm going to go to the color rendering because it's a little easier to read. It's just missing. It was done earlier, so it's just missing a couple of things. But I'll jump back and forth between the PDF and the CAD plan. Um, so here's the rendering. And this is just easier to read because it's not just pure black and white. So we've got the entrance to Potline Lane. Um, we're proposing, so in the, if you're heading in the northbound direction, we're proposing this splitter island um, where the, exi the existing bus pull-off over here will disappear. We're going to run a five-foot wide sidewalk from Potline Lane behind the utility poles all the way up to, this is the new location of the bus pull-off, the proposed new bus pull-off. We've had to remove a utility pole here. That's the one that Eversource agreed to relocate. We're going to put it over here, and then they'll feed the overhead power to Barry's vet clinic over here. Um, so that was the pole we had to ha get moved. And then there's sidewalk ends here at another splitter island with a crosswalk over to Longmeadow Drive. And all these ramps get redone for ADA compliance and all the all, all that sort of stuff. Uh, we do have some proposed trees in here. That'll have to come later with you know, Alan Snow's tree planting plans, um, they're not they're not in the budget currently, but it will be nice if we could add them. And this this uh, southbound bus pull off gets added right here in front of this house, uh, house number 685. So just two houses down from Longmeadow. So both bus pull offs move a little closer to Longmeadow um, and they're about now they're about halfway between Longmeadow and, and Potline. So it's kind of, kind of a compromise for both neighborhoods. Um, and right in the middle, we get a sidewalk on both sides, so it's nice and easy, and you get a crosswalk at each end. Uh, after the bus pull-offs with a splitter island, and we're proposing the um, rapid uh, flashing beacons, rectangular rapid flashing beacons for both pairs of crosswalks. So yeah, we've got the splitter islands to calm traffic, hopefully. We've got the beacons for pedestrian activation and, and visibility. Um, and sidewalks on both sides, relocated bus pull-offs. Um, there's a lot of fill that has to go on down in here because it's a pretty steep drop-off from the road down to this, uh, there's a, a horse pasture down here. Um, but that is the majority of it. Um, we have enough room for five foot bike lanes. We're going down to, we're gonna narrow the travel lanes to encourage slower speeds and uh, what else? I think if, I think at this point I need to switch back over to the black and white plans and go to some of the more detailed drawings because we also added the um, green bike lanes at both of the street crossings. So we're going to do the green bike lane across Potline and the green bike lane, dashed bike lane at Longmeadow. I'll, let me switch back to the black and white PDFs here. And so, and I'll zoom in, oops, switching pages instead of zooming. So you can see here at the Long Meadow Crossing, we're gonna do the green dashes. They're about two feet wide, reflectorized green, the standard bike lane green um, for both of these bike lane crossings. We figure that'll help make the road feel narrow because we're still pretty, you know, we're gonna be pretty wide and if the bike lanes are just painted white, we feel like the cars are just going to sweep right around at their 55 mile an hour cruising speed because they're coming off of a 50 mile an hour zone um, from between Hampshire College and here is, is one of our only 50 mile an hour zones in town. So yeah, we've got the splitter islands. Um, this, just, this is just a slightly more detailed plan. It shows um, all the lane widths, the sidewalk, uh, another splitter island, and it's 20 scale, so it unfortunately cuts the plan in half. I have to flip to here to show, and here's the potline entrance with the bike lane painted across the entrance to potline, um, the 10 and a half foot travel lane to really neck down and make you feel constricted and slow people down with the splitter islands. The splitter islands are, actually, there's a really good detail of the splitter islands. I'll go to that next. Um, and feel free to stop me if anybody has any 
questions because I'm kind of rambling. Um, this is the North Raised Splitter Island detail. Um, and that just gives you a little bit more. There's the RFB pat, uh, bases, um, eight foot wide sidewalk on one side. This side is only six foot wide and narrows to five at other spots. Um, and you've got, this is the Splitter Island detail at Potwine, the south end. Um, very similar setup, sloped granite curbing, uh, stamped concrete cobble in the center, uh, dyed gray. Um, I think that covers, I think, most of it. Oh, this is another good plan. This is kind of the striping and sign plan. Um, it gives you a pretty a good idea of, you know, the, the basic layout of pop line to, to Long Meadow there. Um, and I guess I'll stop there and entertain questions, comments, concerns. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Does anybody have any comments, questions, concerns? Yeah. So what happens at the um, the bus stop specifically? Like, is that area, I'm, I guess I'm kind of missing it. I mean, I mean, overall, I'm excited. I really love the traffic calming measures. I guess I'm just trying to figure out, like, where are you standing? And is it lit at night, um, you know, if you're actually waiting for the bus? Um, I think can't remember if we've talked to PBTA about this or not. I don't think they said there's enough ridership to warrant uh, an actual shelter. Um, they okay. have certain thresholds for ridership that triggers whether they think a shelter is needed or not. Got it. And we've accidentally planted some concrete pads in places where they're like, no, there's not enough riders. So we <laughs> learned to get ahead of that. And so here, let me... Um, I mean, and I think a lot of the traffic there too, I mean, right there, it's like the soccer fields and stuff. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't seem as though that east side of the street is as busy at night. Um, right. So so is the crosswalk on the east side, it's going to run from Potwine to the bus stop? Is that right? Uh, it just to runs crosswalk? across. If we keep them away from the bus pull-offs because we don't want. So here's let's, let's no, I, no, I meant the sidewalk. The sidewalk oh, on the, the sidewalk east side. Yeah. yeah, because there's, be... as you said, there's currently no sidewalk there now, right? Right. That's going to be behind the utility poles. There's a street light at Potwine, and there's a street light at Long Meadow, and then also um, Barry Roberts' property is pretty well lit up with two street right. lights okay. uh, in this parking lot over here is two street lights. They kind of point towards the building, but they do uh, share some illumination. So the bus, the new bus, the northbound bus pull off is going to be right here. We've got a nine foot wide bus pull off. We're adding a curb. Uh, we widen the sidewalk to eight foot there for ADA compliance because they need an eight foot uh, discharge from the handicap bus. Uh -huh. uh, we do the four inch curb reveal because the kneeling buses scrape if it's a six inch curb. Um, so this is the northbound bus pull off is we're kind of we're kind of using the two driveway entrances here as the tapers to get the bus in and get the bus out because that kind of just gives us extra length to get the bus in and out. Uh, we're hopeful that the bus doesn't block the driveways each time and that it can fit in between. Um, and then the southbound bus pull off is sorry where did i lose it oh sorry so the southbound bus pull off is right down here and we're really tight to the right of way here this this dark line here is the right of way line hmm. um so we can just barely fit an eight foot walkway seven foot bus pull off and five and a half foot bike lane and in this case it's kind of becomes the bus shares the bike lane a little bit when it's there sure. not ideal but we're you know working with the right of way that we have so in the two crosswalks then are at the splitter islands, is that right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. We put the two crosswalks with the safety splitter island. It's a it's a it's six foot wide splitter island. So it's a bona fide uh what do you call it? A uh rest not rest area. Uh there's a name for it. I'm blanking. Ref out. Refuge. Refuge island. Thank you. Yeah, so it's a, a bona fide refuge island. You can technically a wheelchair can technically stop there and wait for traffic to clear and then go. Hopefully they don't have to with the RFPs going. But. Can you can you just um, just make this drawing just smaller so it all fits on one? Zoom out to the full, okay. Yeah. 
just so we can see, yeah, get a better idea. So now if somebody is taking, so just in terms of the lighting around there, so yeah. if somebody is taking the bus southbound, so is the light at Potwine on the Potwine side of the street? Yeah, the pole is, I think the pole's right here somewhere. I don't, I think they're turned off on this actual plan. But yeah, the pole's right on the corner of Potwine. So and just like if somebody is waiting, say it's like later, because because you do have um butternut, farms yep. you know in long meadow and so if somebody came out from butternut farms and was going to go southbound and they're waiting on the side of the street like it wouldn't necessarily be as light i mean i, I mean i think the rfb is a great i think the splitter islands are great right. i just know personally like i mean i've been downtown sometimes even with the rfbs flashing as i'm crossing the street and still had cars come very close to me at, while i'm in the middle of crossing Right. So it's just it's a, it just seems like it's always helpful well, you know, to illuminate. I mean, this is possible. PBTA will probably put up their uh, solar powered. Uh, oh sure. Things at the actual bus stops. Okay. You know, the, okay. The schedules and the solar power. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that uh, helps too. It's not super bright, but it's a place to stand and no, like, have a little bit of light. Yeah. I mean, certainly it's a huge improvement from huge improvement. nothing that's there right now, which is just well, and, by yeah. the road. I mean, Standing, and, the reason and, and there's no cross. I mean, currently there are no, I mean, this is something that's come up. Uh, I mean, many, several years ago, we had um, a few people come. I mean, I think, I think we had a forum about this, a public forum. Um, and this certainly alleviates many, many, many of the concerns because mostly people were worried about crossing the street. That's yeah. that was the main concern. Well, and I think with the bus stops, right? So, I mean, it's pretty clear, right? If somebody gets off the bus and they need to cross the street and there's well, no crosswalk, they'll still cross. Right. right. And so and that it's was, good to and, like channel that and then have the and, splitter islands for the and safety. also, yeah, decreasing the speed right there. That was another consideration because at one point we had discussed um, like many roundabouts there at Potwine, yeah. essentially as a traffic calming measure many years ago. I mean, something needs to be done about calming traffic there, particularly with the number of people that are trying to access the buses. So, I mean, this is huge. One of, the cool part, one of the cool parts about this design is that we can still do that roundabout at Potline. Uh -huh. uh -huh. um, that's the, shifting the bus stops all to the north. Right. Was an right. intentional sort of, oh, we could still, we can, so we could in the long term future go forward with a roundabout there. But right. see, this is kind of, you know, this kind of gives you an entrance to the South Amherst village where uh -huh. you know, next next up is the roundabout, you know, right. so it's kind of yeah. almost an extension of that yeah. village yeah. center traffic. Yeah. No, it's real. No, it's and, nice. and it's really okay. exciting to hear that um, you're going to do the green painted bike lanes, you know, at yep. the intersection, because that's come up before. I know, I think we were asking about that at on Beltertown Road and right. just other places to have more contrast. And Guilford was saying that the town has never done the green paint before. Right. Yeah, so is this, is this going to be your first one? Yeah, well, no, except for the DOT work at 9 and 116. Right. Which, right. Now, no, I mean the ones that are like on the town, yeah. town yeah. roads. Yeah. The only other green we've done is the center of the island at pa uh, Pomeroy and, and West Street. Okay. Oh, yeah. the, the mountable island is, is partially brick and partially green, which. So I was in that area. Use for bicycling. Yeah, so one question I had, I was in that area today, just like taking a look at it. Um, and so right like at the roundabout at Pomeroy, you know, there are the bike lanes there um, yeah. approaching the roundabout and and they're all well marked. But then on this section, just south, like it doesn't, particularly on the west side of the street, it's it's yeah. very narrow. The shoulder is very narrow. Right. Um and it doesn't really feel like a bike lane very much. Um, and so, I mean, so I guess if a bike lane is going to, if the bike lanes are going to get added here more officially, um, right. you we see, I mean, there's going to be like a disconnect, I think, between this intersection and the roundabout. Right. I think so, we'll try to remedy that with our next round of striping. Okay. I'll narrow the travel lanes, make the bike lanes a more official. And we think we're due to get a new bike template. I think our old bike template is long gone. Um, so we haven't been refreshing those as often as we should. Um, we also 
bought a new setup where we can do thermoplastic. Uh, they have preformed thermoplastic um, bike symbols that might be actually easier than painted templates yeah. and they last a lot longer. Okay. So we might go that direction depending on the budget. You know, it's, it's always right. cost dependent. Great. I mean, so, so and I think too, um, I mean, again, so it sounds like it will get restriped, right? Because on the, even in this current round of the project, because on that west side, it is really, I'm pretty sure it's like not five feet. <laughs> they, they probably it's went very... with a standard 12 foot lane and we lost a okay. couple of the bike lane. And yeah, we need to like adjust and, and actually go out with our painters and, and lay okay. pre-mark everything for them. And then... And then too, I mean, I had noticed um, like the speed limits in that area. Mm -hmm. And I mean, this has just been something that's on my mind a lot, like particularly as, you know, we're developing more of these traffic calming measures, but then the speed limit signs don't necessarily change. But I noticed today, like if you're driving south on 116, just before Potwine and just before the bus stop, that's when the 50 mile per hour speed limit is. Yeah. It's like, wait a minute, like we're this wow. is like where the bus stop is and things like that. And it's um the official state speed limit. So and it's hard to change. Um we can what we're what we're planning to do here is I think it shows on this sign or this plan. Where was it? Yeah, so we're gonna move the speed limit signs further south. So this is where it's gonna change to 50. Okay. South of Potwine Lane. Um, technically, that doesn't change that this is a, an allowable 50, but we'll put the black and yellow advisories for the splitter islands. And we can, I don't know if we keyed in on what we were going to post here. Um, well, I mean, presumably, too, once you have the splitter islands, right, the actual traffic speeds are not 50. <laughs> Right, right. And I that's, think so. Yeah. I mean, well, and that's the other reason we went with the green painted bike lanes because right. you had a 17 foot wide lane and people right. have to slow down just for one little white stripe that says this is no, a yeah, we'll just sweep right out. And I mean, and I wasn't as, I mean, day. I'm not as concerned about this, um, like the bike lanes here, you know, as I was about Belchertown Road because it's narrow there, yeah. But I mean, I had been reading just about, um, like the mass UT guidance for their projects. And I know this is like a town owned section is like when the road, when the speeds are higher than 40 miles per hour, they yeah. really do try to recommend that there's be some kind of buffering. It's separated. Something with they're separated with the bike yeah. lane because it's not just for the bicyclist safety, you know, at 50 miles an hour, but it's actually, the studies have shown that it's actually too, that drivers would prefer not to have to get too close to bicyclists. Right. Like it's pretty, it's not that friendly to have to do that. <laughs> so, um, yeah. I mean, I hope there's some flexibility with the speed limits too, but it sounds like, I think, um, I get, when I was listening to the TSO recording, it sound, somebody had asked about that. And I think Guilford was saying that once, um, once the traffic calming is put in to look at changing the speed limit then. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And then you can do the study and say that this is the new, you know, if you can get the 80, 85th percentile, but to be lowered that makes your argument a lot easier there they right. some flexibility in lowering beyond the 85th percentile but they still they lean on the 85th percentile yeah they lean yeah. on the 85th percentile I mean, right. pretty so heavily the, still so the new like meutcd guides that came out in december right it does say yeah. that you can be more like context sensitive in terms of like yeah, bikes exactly. and heads and everything yeah, they give but you i haven't leeway i don't know if mass thoughts issued new guidance like since that came out, but um, it seemed like that was a big improvement, right? Because yeah. I mean, a lot of people have been saying for a long time it shouldn't just be based on the eighty fifth percentile speed. So, right. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, that sounds. Yeah, that sounds, sounds great. really great. Yeah. Is there a place to tie your horse next to the bus stop? <laughs> you take your, take you'll, your you'll horse have, over to the bus stop. You'll have to leave it with Barry. Gonna... I do feel, I feel like, um, you know, sort of one in three people that I see standing there is always kitted out in their horse riding. Oh, yeah. They oh, right. Yeah. yeah. Muddy Brook Farm. Yeah. Yeah. 
and then they take the bus home and they just yeah. don't change each other. And I mean, and I mean, I will say of the like projects that uh, the DPW and the town manager put forth to the council, you know, all at that same meeting, whatever that was in March, you know, that this, it was clear that this one like really had the most traffic calming. So I really appreciate that. And, um, and I, I shared it with, um, I, there's a, a family who lives on Potline and there's two um, transportation engineering professors who live there and they, they liked it too. So. Oh, they did. That's good. <laughs> and they have three little kids. N yeah. Next time, next people will be asking you to slow down the traffic on Potline, but one step at a time. Yeah. So. Okay. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. That was great. Thank you. Sure. All right. So I guess, do we feel like we need to take an official vote or anything? I feel like we should, right? Okay. Because so we just we support the project as proposed, and uh... yes. Okay. I agree. I guess I guess we could also just say that um, we should probably mention something more about um, you know the lighting yeah. piece, meaning um, for the the um, people waiting at the. I mean, that's just no. from us, like so so that we can keep it at the forefront if there are ever yeah. is any money to add or if they need if lights going if there's money for lights i think you know bus stops should mm. be lit or um or at least or even the crossings potentially you know with, yes. with lighting so this whole area in my opinion could be better lit but we but the road improvements are excellent like i can we incorporate that somehow into our? I think I mean we can write up a brief like memo, you know, okay. as we typically do. That we, I mean, because um, Jason has filled in some details, right, that we didn't really yeah. necessarily uh -huh. get from the short two-page memo and the small they, drawing. They sell RFBs now with projector lights. UMass installed them on Mass Ave. I haven't been over them there at night to see them yet, but Which they ones? Install, so um, the ones up Mass Ave supposedly have. Um, they have the flashing lights, but then they also have lights that project out into the crosswalk to light up the cross. Oh, that's nice. Yes, that is true. That's that true. Would be, that would be good too, I think. So you could recommend those for yeah. here if you wanted to. I mean, yeah. And it would depend on the yeah. budget, but. Right. Yeah, of course. But now, but well, I, I will say that my office at UMass, I'm on, I'm on Mass Ave, yeah, and that I'm, my office is right next to, across the street from the Southwest dorms. And that they have um, the the flashing lights there are automatically sensed, you know, when the in the right. presence of pedestrians. But I will also say that if it is snowing or if it is raining, they are blinking all the time. Oh, that's annoying. They do not stop. <laughs> I start. I'm worried about putting RFBs near residences now because of the audible signal that's required. Um, oh, we have to well, learn how to. There's settings where you can turn them lower at night. Um, well, and I noticed like at, that um, they beep constantly at I, the Pomeroy intersection today, right? Yeah. Because all the RFBs are blinking, uh, beeping, and yeah. it does seem like a lot of beeping. It <laughs> so, is. It's a it requirement is a for the visually impaired, though. No, it could, yeah. But yeah, yeah. I, I worry about putting them in residential areas now because of that. That, you know, if I put it outside someone's house, they can potentially lose their mind. Yeah, <laughs> right. The right, right. But there's adjustments that can be made. Sure, sure. That still fall within the regulations. Cool. cool. Um, yeah. So, so I, I go ahead, Kim. Do you maybe? I mean, it seems like we have um, unanimous opinion about this, but perhaps we could. You could send, you know, write up the memo, and yeah. then we can all um, do a sure. email approval or whatever. Or why we could just why don't we just take a vote that we like support the projects um, overall? You know we yes. do have we support the okay. project overall. We support the elements that Jason's discussed. You know we do have a few concerns as you mentioned, Kim, like you know about lighting and speed limits and like other things. But that doesn't take away from our yeah. approval of the project. Correct. Um, okay, so, so um, and, so I propose a motion that we um uh vote and approval of the proposed project okay i second that i vote yes and so does joe he raises he rose raised his hand and i do and, yes and joe do you want anything else to say 
the right. Okay. All right. So we are supporting that uh, unanimously. unanimously four to zero with two members absent. Okay. Thank Great. you. Okay. And then I guess we can get to the um, Transportation Commission. So Jason, um, I had put on the agenda some other items just that are traffic related, but hopefully we can invite you back some other time okay. <laughs> on some of that stuff on you know, like the safe routes to school stuff and Henry Street and yeah. other things. Stuff is like moving forward. We're just waiting for the budget to come up, you know, come around and, and get prices and stuff like that. So we are moving forward on some of that stuff. And I do think that it looks like in the final capital improvement, the capital budget, there was some money in there for um, like some kind of like speed radar signs or school zone signs or something near the school. So yeah, yeah, we got, that, already that have the speed, the feedback signs. Okay. Uh, at, it, our electrician has those in, in okay. hand. Um, we just need to get the um, special safety zone signs and then we can put, Special safety zones and the and the speed feedback signs. Um, we've got it okay. pretty much got it laid out in my head, but I haven't put it on paper. Right, right. Well, and I think too. I mean, one key thing with the speed feedback signs, if they're going in near the schools, is that um, it has to be decided when the school zone speed limits will be in effect, right? Because currently, I think it's about half an hour, forty minutes in the morning and afternoon, and that, I mean, un otherwise the underlying speed limits apply. Right. Which could be like 30 well, or 40 or whatever. Are you, are you talking so, for Cushman or for schools in general? No, for the schools, the ones around oh, the for schools. schools in general. Sorry, yeah. I thought you were talking about the Cushman special. No, school. no. That's yeah. going to be in effect 24-7. Okay, okay seven, got miles it. Miles an hour at Cushman. But um, but yeah, we, I, yeah. I, I'm all for extending the hours sure. of the weekends. As, right. as long as they're not flashing all the time, because I think people no. get used to them if they flash all the time. Yes. Like, yeah, you know, and um, 24-7. And Chief Tang seemed like he's supportive of that too. So yeah, cool. All right, okay. thanks. Well, thank you all. I'm gonna. All right, thank you. Up. I appreciate okay. it. Um, thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, Stop Jason. And say goodbye. Thanks. Okay. Bye. Take care. Thank you. All right, Paul. It's your turn. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so it's been a while coming. So I, I think so. This is a, a proposal to create a new committee commission that would replace TAC, but actually give the commission actual power to make decisions. I don't know if the council is going to approve it, um, but it, I think this is the right way to go. Uh, I, I know there's been a lot of frustration from TAC and about the role of TAC. There's been a lot of frustration from the public about how do we get stuff done and approved. There's been a lot of frustration from staff with the number of meetings that staff have to go through go to um so there's a lot of frustrations all across the board and um you know for any proposal that uh, a road proposal so many cities and towns have a traffic and or parking commission that has independent authority or um is the single point of, of entry for people to bring um recommendations that then go to the council so there's two models one is that this would be a committee that would be the single point of entry. There wouldn't be an interstitial council committee um, that things would come to the committee and then they would refer to the to the council. The other model is that this is a committee that has actual authority to make the decisions and has the final authority to make the decisions. Um, you know, this is I, I, I proposed this in a memo, which I think is in your packet some time ago. Um, and um, the council said, interesting idea, go work on it more, talk it over with TAC, and then it's come back to the council. It's not in TSO, it has it stayed with the council. So so this is the, the conversation. And this has taken a lot of different shapes at different times. Uh, the first couple drafts were very specific about what this commission would be responsible for. And then as we started to work on it more with the staff, we started to think, well, we should actually model it on the town council's um, policy on public ways because they have already addressed their, I'm going to back up a second, under the town charter, the town council is responsible for public ways. So all the power lies with the council on that. So we, and they've already said, well, there's some things we want to see on a regular basis and there's some things we're delegating to the town manager. We don't, if someone wants to 
utilize a parking space for a day because they're doing contracting work, that doesn't, they don't have to come to the town council. If someone is reserving the town common for a day, we don't want to see all those things. If someone, you know, the, you know, there's some things that, that need to be happen because you have to close a road for construction. We don't want to see those things. The bigger things we do want to see. And, um, but then what has happened is that some of these bigger things come and then they get, we, they get bogged down uh, in process. Uh, we've also had our residents who have say, I want a new sidewalk on my street or I, and they go to the council or they, you know, they come to TAC and, and, and they come to staff. And, um, and so they say, well, I'm going to put in a resident capital request because I need, I want this to be happen. And there's no single point of um, entry into help. So it's really unfair to the public in terms of how do I get something addressed? And it's not like, and it's, and for most things, we can't just say yes. Right, because there's there's engineering. There's usually big issues that go along that go along with that. Um, a, a case in point is the whole Henry Street discussion that you know people are very um, uh, anxious about, you know, and pushing that forward and frustrated by that process. Since that has come, we've had we're starting to get more um, traffic calming requests from air, from different neighborhoods. Like East Leverett Road has come in and saying we want traffic calming, and we'll hear more. We anticipate we're here. We'll hear more. And I don't think the council is really equipped to get into the level of detail that these types of requests need to have be reviewed. And also, um, I don't think I think we need more sort of overview policy making. These are things that you have experienced. So I'm not I'm not telling you anything you don't know. And I appreciate that. But I do want I just didn't want it to frame where this is coming from. So we finally have something reduced to paper that you can react to that tries to address some of these issues. And so it's basically this is a conversation. It may it won't won't be the last conversation. Um and at some point we'll take it back to the council and see what they think. I've talked with some counselors. And there's sort no one has said yes. Please bring it to me. They all understand the challenges. Um, I think there's going to be some challenge for counselors giving up authority that they hold right now. But you know that's something that's a conversation we will want to have. So that's sort of where we are, and just sort of open, like have a, just a, a informal conversation if we can. Um. So so I started reading over um the proposal the yeah. whatever the proposed charge or whatever yeah. and um to me um having been on you know I was on the I've been on this for a long time now mm -hmm. when it was just like the bike and pedestrian one yeah. and um and having experienced and and then um when we became the tech we also had a bunch of um people uh, well, a bunch, several people who are there specifically for parking issues. And eventually they transitioned off because it seemed like it, that wasn't really, a, it, it wasn't, they weren't, they weren't feeling like they were accomplishing a lot because it, because that really wasn't something that we were addressing. And, um, and then the parking issues that have come up, there are some that are directly related. So parking isn't transportation as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> Parking is another problem. Um, it is a public way issue, of course. Um, and, you know, it is obviously at the end of a travel, <laughs> but um, it, it feels like, it also feels like something of a, like things have come up about budgetary issues surrounding parking. And I'm just feel like maybe parking per se it, sh it shouldn't be part of the mm -hmm. the charge for this because because to me it feels like you know something that I think would really help the problems that you were just discussing um like our bike our our pedestrian and bike plan you know that's a long term plan for the whole town right mm -hmm. and and then it could feed into a lot of these requests or um I, I'm not sure how parking fits into that. So, so my initial reaction is, you know, 
I like the idea of, of having a commission that looks at the town as a whole and helps prioritize um, uh, uh, street ish, issues related to street and um, travel. Um, but parking seems a little bit out of the, it, it feels hard to figure out how that fits in. Of course, it does fit in to transportation because, because for example, one of the issues that had come up um, with us and the TSO was like parking on Lincoln, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and that obstructs the public, that it obstructs, you know, travel. And, um, but a lot of the parkings, for example, parking in town doesn't obstruct travel and doesn't, so it feels like a little too much. That's my. Yeah, you me. know, it, 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 we had that, ex we really did talk about that. And because we thought, well, maybe we have a parking commission and a transportation commission. Should we have two different bodies? And as we sort of talk through it, um, I think what we, our experience has been like on Lincoln, it did, it was more of a, as much a part, a tra transportation issue as a parking issue. The back end parking, you know, um, in terms of the, you know, that was as much a tr transportation issue because you're talking about other travel lanes. And that's true. And so we started to think, well, maybe, and, you know, Guilford basically said, rather have like one stop shopping, you know, like from, for permitting, like let's have somebody over looking at the whole thing. Totally open to the, the, the other. I, I think the idea of setting fees and stuff like that is, would not be part of the, the concept of this. It's more, um as parking relates to public way yeah and, like, yeah, and, I didn't, I mean, yeah. and i didn't think that we should like this should include like off-street parking for example yeah. because i mean i do look at it i do see parking as a transportation issue like i was just downtown this afternoon and i saw somebody come out of one of the angled spaces and instead of just going in their adjacent travel lane, they went across all the travel lanes to go in the opposite direction, right? And I've seen people, you know, back out into where the buses are. I mean, yeah. it's a traffic flow issue. It's a safety issue. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the things on Lincoln, right, is the sight lines. Yeah. And so I, I do really see on-street parking as related to safety and traffic flow and, you know, where are the bike lanes? Like, how is everybody moving around that? I don't but, see off-street parking that way. Right. Um, so I, and I, and, I, and I don't think, like, in terms of the fees and things, I don't, I don't think – like that, the decisions on those things should be made by this commission. I mean, the, it seems like only, that should be made by like the finance or the parking lead. Right. Or so, so the only sort of so-called off-street parking that's in a public way is the Spring Street lot. The other lots are not in the public way and not under the jurisdiction of the council. So, uh, like the like Boltwood and Amity Street, those lots. Right. They're not public ways. Um. Yeah. So, and I mean, and the way it was written to, I mean, one thing I was thinking about when I went through the charge, um, this new version of the charge is just in terms of like, I was curious about how many types of, like for certain items, like how many requests or how many complaints or things mm -hmm. that town hall staff is getting. And, you know, is that going to take away like I, I do feel like the transportation parking commission, transportation commission. I mean, there's things I really like about it in terms of that it does allow for decision making, but it also has not just an advisory group of residents, but also it has staff there, and so hopefully the staff and the residents are talking together, and then they're showing their rec they're making their recommendations instead of because it seems currently like somewhat disjointed sometimes that like in the case of Heatherstone, for example, like Heather, some Heatherstone residents have been talking to the DPW for maybe 10 mm -hmm. or 15 years about the issue. It just came to TAC for the first time that I've been on TAC just a few months ago. And they're talking about like changes and we're not really familiar with it. I mean, so, but again, there were these other conversations, the same thing that was happening with Henry Street a little bit, right? where the police have talked to people on Henry Street or DPW. There's all these different conversations going on. And so it seems really powerful and also just efficient if like the main groups of staff are like in the room together, talking about it together and speaking more with one voice instead of like all these different voices. 
and then and also for the residents just to be then included the residents who are on the commission to be included in that instead of just hearing about it kind of after the fact so um but i did for example i mean one thing was here it talked about that um you know that the that this commission could help you know develop procedures for submitting and responding to complaints related to parking so like one thing i was thinking is i bet sometimes people complain a lot about parking like if they get a ticket or and so like how many for the smaller kinds of complaints i would hope that they wouldn't come to the commission well ticket for complaints example. have a different process that oh, okay. they, we, have a, we right. have an appeal process that all we right so maybe just to like clarify that it's not the tickets. Mm -hmm. People have very strong opinions about tickets um, <laughs> and getting tickets. And um, I guess and... I'm curious. Uh, um, oh, sorry, Tracy. Go ahead now. Yes. Yeah, I just was. I mean, Paul, you mentioned that it might not be easy for the um, the council to give up its power. I mean, would one of these proposals over another be more um, amenable to to them? I mean, they, they certainly need to understand the problem of mm -hmm. several different points of entry <laughs> of complaints and conversations that aren't, um, you know, triaged in any way. So uh, I think they've got to understand that, but I'm just curious I, I guess I'm just trying to understand where, which one of these would be um, an easier sell if, if mm -hmm. they would agree that there's a problem. Um, I think it's, I think counselors, especially district counselors, are going to care about what happens in their neighborhoods and they want to fix what the complaints are coming to them. So a lot of a lot of complaints come into it, district counselors at district meetings. Someone will say, hey, I want to crosswalk here. I want at the end of Fisher Street or wherever they want to or Harris Street. I want to crosswalk here, and they and the counselors feel um, like that's their one of their jobs is constituent services. And I think that's a thing that might be a barrier. I think there's a the one thing we put in there um, about the town commons. So yeah. I think like putting a band shell on the common. I think they're going to say no. That's we're we're not giving that to anybody else. That's us. And I. Then that's right. It's the right thing to do. That's a right. That's a right decision, I think. But we wanted to be consistent with the the policy that they developed, and then be able to flex it as they as they like to. However, they do. Yeah. However they do. I mean, personally, I I don't think that the a transportation commission should be overseeing like uses on the common, unless they're directly related to like the public. Unless they're directly related to mobility. So, so the, the so the one thing where that comes into play, the one thing that comes to the council every year is the farmer's market. The farmer's market wants to use the common. Uh, they had been using the Spring Street parking lot. So because it's more than 14 days, it goes to the council. If it's mm. under 14 days, I can approve it. Um, so like the Rotary Fair, I can approve, but the farmer's market, they have to approve. And the first couple of years, it was kind of like a lot of back and forth. They had a lot of education of themselves. What, you know, why, why don't they pay for parking, all that kind of stuff. So I think that that's, that's, that's the type of thing where I don't think they really care about that. Honestly, they don't put any time into it. A commission might have more input into like how it gets done, I think. Yeah. I mean, okay. I, I mean, I care about it, you know, from like the, I mean, if it was to come in terms of like a farmer's market being in the parking lot, you know, where where the Spring Street lot is also like a thoroughfare, mm -hmm. I can see that coming. But in terms of like other strictly like fares and other uses on the common, it just see, I mean, when I saw that, it, it made me think too, like how many types of requests like that come there's, in? There's only like, one. Is it, is it taking <laughs> away time? No, from the... no it's, it's only one because if, nobody asks for 14 days on the common ever. Oh, except that's the farmer's true. Market. Got it. It's, okay. it's, that's the, it's a time threshold that elevates it. Unless right. someone says we want to establish an encampment. <laughs> okay. Right. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, so overall, I thought that that was good. Um, and on some of these, I mean, so, you know, when I think about Northampton, Northampton has a transportation and parking commission, and they look at these same things in detail. 
but they are considered to be like advisory to their council. Mm -hmm. And, and I don't actually think, I don't have a problem with that. Like if I understand that, you know, transportation and transportation safety is a concern of a lot of counselors, it's a concern of constituents, they feel like they want to be involved. And I can see where some counselors might be reluctant to kind of give up all of that and just say, okay, we're going to let this commission of a few staff members and a few residents who may not even be in my district. Like, yeah, so, so we don't need to speculate what the, yeah. what the council no, will do. They'll, they'll do no, their own saying. speculation. <laughs> That's true. But, um, but if, if, I mean, if the charge was made more advisory, like I could see it. I mean, couldn't it be something where, you know, if it comes to the council, like it gets referred to this commission as opposed to getting referred to a council committee and then it can come back and then the council would just take a vote. Yeah. So I guess what, the reason I was not recommending that was because I didn't want it to be like, you know, mom and dad, like the, the transportation commission said no. So now I'm going to go to the council and have to do the entire thing over again. It's like to have clarity of decision making. Um, you know, I thought about an appeal process, but then it's everything will get appealed automatically. So why? Yeah. It just seemed like, yeah. I mean, as long as the council isn't having its, like, as long as the council, I mean, because there are other committees that are, make recommendations to the council and then the council takes the final vote. So I could see it kind of like that, where the council isn't necessarily reviewing stuff in depth as well, particularly like if the commission has so are a you, hearing. Would you, like, like, are, would you like to see an advisory? Is that what you're saying, Tracy? I mean, I'm saying... I'm saying that I can imagine that there would be pushback on some of the larger right, changes. Right, but I'm, I'm looking for your opinions oh. now. Um, yeah. I, my opinion is I, I, I think this is fantastic, personally. I, I do love the synergy, or not the synergy, the, the sort of, I don't know, forced conversation, however you want to call it, of the, you know, the, um, the chiefs or designees and, and the, um, you know, superintendent of public works along with the public. I think that's a recipe for success. Um, I, so I, I mean, in, in general, I think this is, this is a much stronger, easier path for just Joe public to understand um, as well as the folks who are actually intimately involved um, to understand with clarity. So I just, I think it brings a huge amount of, um, clarity and simplicity of the process and then the actual deciders or implementers I guess are in the room and in on it from the beginning and I, I just think that there's a lot there that's um, that's really helpful to to sort of remove the barrier of like four different individual conversations happening in four different arenas that then never cross over so anyway that's my personal view as I think this is um, I, I just, I just think that this is so much better than anything that we have right now. Well, um, right. <laughs> I mean, well, currently, right. What will happen is that items will go from the council and then they'll get referred to TSO and then TSO will consult TAC or DAC, or maybe they won't. I mean, because there's a lot of items here that I've asked about, like, hey, how come this never came to TAC? And I was told, well, it's already going to so many other people, <laughs> like the TAC doesn't need to weigh in. So I do appreciate like even, you know, things like the e-bike stations and things like that. I do think that those things are helpful for a committee or a commission on transportation to see. Um, and then, right, so then once it goes to TAC and DAC, then it goes back to TSO, then it goes back. I mean, it's so long, and I can see that it could be frustrating to staff, and it's frustrating for people who are looking for results. Um, I like the idea, too, you know, just having these coordinated conversations. And, I mean, the way that capital improvement process with the public input, that doesn't really work now, right, because even though residents are allowed to submit the requests, I mean, it seemed that the JCPC, one of the comments they had is they said, well, this didn't come from a department. This didn't come from a commit, like this is coming from a resident. Where does this all fit in? So hopefully that could also be part of the commission's charge, you know, looking at those like bigger issues about, you know, some of the prioritization and things like that. Those are things that have been talked about for a while since before I even joined TAC about having just like over half of the 
um, municipalities in Massachusetts have. They have complete streets prioritization plans where you've identified like what are your priority projects for your town and then you're eligible for complete streets funding. And sometimes sometimes plans have like 50 or 60 or more projects, but it does make you eligible for the funding. Um, because I do think it is hard. I mean, I and I've I've gotten contacted sometimes you know, either by counselors or by residents in certain areas who are looking for something like right near their property, um, saying, well, it's not safe on our street or, but we just know that, I mean, having that bigger framework about like, where are the main corridors and like, where are the main, there are certain places where people have been asking for improvements for a really long time. And I understand that everybody wants improvements in their neighborhoods and everybody wants slower traffic near their homes, but we can't, they're not all kind of equal in terms of priority. And and also we have limited funds, right? And sometimes like our sidewalk budget got cut and things like that. So it's but, good to have a framework for that. Yeah, but it's also so my my main concern about about um not having a prioritization plan which slots like requests into into their place, you know, based on some kind of metric, is that the people who have the least time to complain or perhaps feel like the least mm -hmm. um, emboldened to speak aren't getting heard. And it's like those of us with extra time or whatever are the ones that are so so I what I've really appreciated about our tech and our prioritization is like we're just looking where people live, where lots of people live and, and, and making, and where town centers are and where bus stops are and where people need to get to places are. Um, and, and, and like, like making it equitable. And I hate throwing that word around. I feel like it's a word that everyone's using, but I really feel like that's something that we have actually worked on really hard. And then, you know, part of the issue with the new form of government is that you only hear from the people who have the time. And I feel like for transportation issues, it really affects, especially the use of the public way um, and bus and walking and all that is like people who may not have more time. Like I feel like having an overall plan, which is something that we have, we're good at because we can think in a large framework um that's yeah. something really yeah. needs to be done and but that's I, what, yeah that, that's a, that's a great point i mean they they call that the aristocracy of time you know um that people who have the time they they have more they, they hear hear more the other thing that we liked i like about this i'll be personal about it is that um and this no offense to the counselors but a counselor a district counselor wants something in their neighborhood they know if their neighborhood, their next door neighbor um, district counselor wants something, they're going to be like, well, you sh you voted for mine, I'll vote for yours. I like the idea that what you just said, Kim, is that there's an overview, there's reference to planning, there is a, a, a comprehensive view of things in a more objective manner, um, as opposed to these are the loudest voices. Right. And I think that that's what an independent body brings you. Right. And that's, that's what I think... I feel like we had done well in the past yeah. and then with the new form of government, all that's kind of out the window. And so I think bringing that piece back is really valuable. Mm -hmm. So Kim, do you see this draft um, proposal that Paul's prepared as a structure to in enable um, sort of like a planning and a decision-making regime that's sort of agnostic to those pressures or, so or I didn't I didn't exactly that? see that here because again okay. it seems like it's reliant a lot on and I don't know on on complaints and where those go and and yeah. like that needs to have a place too I don't I'm not saying it doesn't because certainly things can be there that our body hasn't seen because we're not like, you know, walking on that street in the middle of the night or doing that on a Saturday, late in a Saturday or something. I don't know, but, um, or things can be emergent for sure. Um, so I guess, I guess like 
Well, maybe, maybe Paul, um, if you were to add um, an element into the, the sort of in addition part, you know, you kind of go through here are the, um, the places that this, this um, commission would have authority. And then there's in addition, you could say, um, develop clear and consistent long range plans. Mm -hmm. Right. And, um, pri and prioritization. So, and yeah, yeah no, that like seems like that one. element in there. So um, it's, I mean, to me, that was sort of inferred in what he wrote, but, um, but I have no problem making it um, explicit. No, yeah, I, th I, th I think that would be a good addition. Yeah, I, I think uh, I'm going to say one thing. Then I see Joseph has raised his hand. One of the things is that we 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 always walk this this balance between we want to be responsive to public requests, right? That's part of our jobs. We're we're customer service organization, but also we want to make sure that we're handling the taxpayers' funds equitably and responding equitably to people. It doesn't really happen, honestly. You know, certain neighborhoods are more privileged and they know how to activate themselves. But, um, and so we have to be responsive to that, but we try to be, you know, utilize that. Yeah. But Joseph has his hands. Are you, are you seeking to- Yeah, yeah, I was just curious if, if other townships using this model have a more formalized uh, complaint process being utilized and, and tracking of it that you're aware of. Complaint process? um i don't know i don't know yeah meaning so is is the only way that so this transportation committee will receive complaints are people that would show up to transportation and, and parking committee meeting or do they have other oh. access points for that yeah no i think what would, our goal would be to have a portal that people could submit like sort of a, not see click fix but something where we want we want a new sidewalk on east pleasant street or whatever it is right I think so. I mean, internally, so, I mean, typically, you know, every year, every year and a half, like, um, for a while, TAC did receive those complaints. There was a form, a PDF form that was on the TAC website, but it wasn't actually like an e-form. It actually had to be like printed out and sent in. And those, you know, then sometimes Amber would, you know, forward those to us. Um, also, sometimes people contact the TAC at amherstma.gov address, which also goes to DPW. And it trickles over to TAC sometimes, not all the time. Um, I think it is helpful to, you know, if there can be sort of a one-stop way for people to submit submit comments, complaints, concerns. Um, um, so, but previously at the TAC meeting, sometimes, you know, Guilford would have a spreadsheet, that, a running spreadsheet he would be keeping of the different um, mm -hmm. things that have been requested and he would share that with us because typically we wouldn't be aware of many of them. Of course, they can come in through so many different channels, you know, through phone calls, through people stopping by the office, through emails, through these forms. Like, there's so many different options. So if there is a way to sort of track that, I think it is helpful. But it's also helpful if people understand, sort of similar to see click fix, but a little more comprehensive about what are the next steps in that process. Like, right, just because, I mean, I think that that was one thing with, having residents submit capital improvement requests. Like, I mean, it does, it could make people feel that oh, if I submit my request and it's a worthy request, it's gonna get funded, right? Like clearly there's this need and it's just, we have a lot of needs and we don't have enough resources to pay for all those. So you don't want it to be misleading to people, but just to have people understand like that it's been accepted and you know, it's being considered and things like that. I mean, I think any of that clarification is great and I also, um, I think I had mentioned to you, Paul, but when I was at the District 3 meeting, which was held down at Graff Park a few weekends ago, um, somebody from the DPW mentioned on the C-Click Fix request that sometimes they're getting complaints or comments that are things that aren't either under like DPW jurisdiction or if it's road related, it might not even be a town road, but residents don't always know that, right? Mm -hmm. And so when they're contacting this, they want to respond to things. And so if there is ways to improve the communication around that, um, and, and just, um, and just let people know, well, that's not a, you know, that's not a town road. You'd have to contact the district office, Mass DOT or whatever it is. Um, so that people do feel like they're kind of not kind of left out there without any kind of options of what to do next. So, mm -hmm. 
um, like the more we can, you know, have those processes and make them transparent, I think are helpful. Um, I did review, you know, when we were going through putting together the charge, I know you and I both were looking at different commissions that have been set up around the state for, you know, the transportation commissions. And at least, you know, one of the ones I reviewed, they did, they did have these long meetings where they would go through like each of the requests that they had received. So there would be a forum in which those were held and at least reviewed and and then for the next meeting they'd be following up or like what are the ones we need to follow up on for next time and the action items related to those so um i wouldn't want it to just be that kind of i mean i do like the longer planning element too you know i am a transportation planner i have that background but it is helpful for people to feel like like things are proceeding through the system and they know what yeah. to expect yeah and, and so we do have a spreadsheet that a shows balance. all yeah we, we have a spreadsheet if i can share with you if, if you'd like that sure. shows all 59 um communities that have something like this with links to it, it, it sort of outlines the basics of what each community has that helped inform this you know i think one of the things that we're really working on for staff is we have to also say no to people and to the council and we've struggled with that because you know we try to serve the council but the staff are just getting stretched too thin and we're getting burnout. So, and, and so like, for instance, you know, there, there's a topic the council is dealing with now. We, we want to say, if you either fund a position to do it, which we don't have money to do, that means we have to take it, take a position away from something else, or, um, you know, you, we just can't do it. Or, you know, there's like, we, you, you have to choose something that you want, you have on your list for town manager goals that you're not going to do. So trying to have some forced decisions, just, um, just I've heard a lot of feedback from folks on being, but this is one that's been consistent since before the council. This has happened when I came here with the select board, it was always the same, you know, TAC was more, in, you know, more robust at that point in time because you had more people. <laughs> um, so, yeah. In, in tax current charge, like the one that was drawn up by the select board, I mean, it does say that TAC will track like requests and help develop the prioritization. But I think that, I mean, that charge is clearly out of date, but also TAC as, an, as a volunteer based committee, like without staffing too, that we just do not have that capacity. And also for certain types of requests, you know, if people have potholes or things like that, there's nothing like we don't have any role with that as well. So yeah, but I think that um, we've talked yeah. a lot about that this commit this commission would need real staffing. Not it can't rely on you know Chris and Guilford happening to show up or something like that. Mm -hmm. And sort of, sure. I think it's going to really need monthly management and more dedicated staffing, which is going to require us to create a forced decision on what we where we put it. Okay. So I did have a question just on the composition of it, like, um, you know, in terms of the staff, like to have staffing from planning, DPW, like fire and police. And then, you know, and then like later on in the charge, it says, well, you, and you can also consult like people who are like the finance and parking staff and so on. But I was curious about um, the fire chief and the designee just you know, I know that our emergency like personnel are stretched pretty thin too, and they're pretty busy. Um, and that it seems to me like that the police being on the committee are there both from like a safety perspective in terms of emergency response um, with transportation, but also because they're also involved with enforcement of speeding and things like that. And that, that maybe, I mean, it's, a, I mean, not to kick a fire chief off of it, but it just seems like they may have other priorities and maybe they could also be on the list of like the other departments mm -hmm. that are consulted. Yeah, I mean, um, any traffic thing we do, we consult with fire because it's all about their fire trucks and, and sure. they, you know, even like when we were looking at Henry Street and they're talking about speed humps, like we okay. had to talk, we talked with the, the assistant chief and he says, right. yeah, fire trucks have water, so we do have to slow down. Does that impact right. our response time? Yes, but okay. not it has a response on Lincoln Street. You know, he also said, if we hit one of those bumps and we are not, we're not prepared for it, or we our driver doesn't notice it, he said, I've hit my head on the when I'm working on a patient on the roof. That's not a good place to be. So, yeah, sure. so we, that was feedback I had not thought about before. So that kind of feedback. The only other group that you know I, I didn't we didn't really address explicitly was the 
you know, because I see the council, the council tends to say, or the TSO committees tends to send it to TAC and to DAAC. And we're just trying to eliminate the number of times that, say, Guilford or Jason have to go to a committee, right? Like, sure. or, or a resident has to. And so the only other thing I thought about was to have a slot, a representative from DAAC on it somehow or something like that. I don't, we didn't really solve that problem. Yeah. I mean, I think so when I had reviewed a draft version, right, I had tried to add some DAAC elements into like the public members, yeah. you know, that you want to have like, because you also want, you know, Tracy, people with different what is, experiences. Okay, what is the, the, what is the it? Disability Access oh. Advisory oh, Committee. Oh, okay. okay, Myrna. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So just, I mean, just because you want people who are coming from like different, you know, socioeconomic backgrounds and different lived experiences related to transportation. So I was yeah. trying to expand it that way. Um, I mean, I think that some of what the commission would talk about would be of great interest to DAC and some of it would be of less interest. Um, mm -hmm. On the fire, I mean, I when I look at the, the ways the other, you know, towns that have commissions are structured, like some of them do include fire and some don't. Yeah. But um, so we, can, we can add that as an option. Yeah. We can look at that. Um, That's, I have that note. And um, yeah, but. I agree with you, Tracy, both on, I mean, every, almost every street improvement that we've, um, we've um, consulted on always goes to um, disabil the disability. Right. Sure. That's and true. And it seems like that's a no brainer. I mean, okay. well, and I had talked to them. Be on, uh, someone should, you know, or at least have, have someone involved in it who, who has those types of experiences or professional yeah. experience, uh, expertise on the committee, because I, it feels like that mm -hmm. is an important input that a lot of us don't. Well, and as like the tech chair, like I do try to go to the disability access advisory committee meeting sometimes just to listen in. Um, and I have talked to their committee and, you know, I've thought about us formally having like members on each other's committees, yeah. which we no. haven't done that formally. Um, but it seems but it, 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 seems it is like, an important community yeah. like to be reached. Yeah, that might be that might be one way to do but it. But I also I also agree on the the fire. Um, I mean, having someone from one of the professional um, services, police or or mm -hmm. fire, paramedic, even here. I mean, it seems like police because they also drive large vehicles and have mm -hmm. a fairly good understanding of the needs of um, large large vehicles on the streets. You know, right? And certainly, you know, uh, yeah. And the feedback that we've gotten from DPW, you know, when you look at different traffic calming measures that have you know, vertical deflection, right? That DPW is quite sensitive to yeah. the idea of having buses and, yeah, right, right. you know, larger vehicles, larger town vehicles having to go over when you have a lot of vertical deflection, like some of those speed bumps at UMass, because right. I have hit my head on those, <laughs> those very extreme ones that they put in. Mm -hmm. So, um, what? So are you guys are you guys saying that you want to add um, DAC into like as a voting member, well, or at as least the, as a possible consultant, depending on the project at hand? I mean, I'm I'm just trying to get a grasp on. To me, it feels like at least someone with with expertise, and you know, professional expertise or or. A personal stake in the matter. Yeah, the I mean, it could be with a deep understanding of multiple needs, right? Of, it, it could so. be a staff person related to DAC, mm. um, or it could, I don't know. And we don't have anybody like that really. I, I wonder, mean, I mean, could the DAC actually have um, a member within it that crosses over to this commission? Or, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, you do do cross appointments sometimes, right? Yeah, like we do planning, that, you know, appointment to the CPAC committee or yeah. Yeah. So and then it's still a volunteer sure. committee member, but the person understands them to also be, mm -hmm. maybe it is a fourth committee member, but sure. it's specific to DAC or something. Yeah. So what I hear you saying is DA, we need to address the DAC input into this group. I, yeah. I, I feel like that's formally. Really yeah. Yeah. Especially if the idea is to decrease the number yeah. of committees. Yeah, I agree. Good right. And, 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 the other, it would... and, I, and the question is whether a question mark on fire, is it really, ur is it 
Correct. Well, yeah. to the oh, yeah. yeah. Well, I think maybe, you, maybe if the they fire. weren't if it if they weren't designated as a member expressly, right? They could also be listed as like the people that are contacted too. Mm -hmm. Um and there was one thing um that you know is in the current tax charge and I don't really know, I don't see it here in part because this was built, you know, from the public way policy. Um, but something like larger picture stuff related to transit. So, yeah. um, you know, back in the days of the public public transportation and bike committee, um, when I first came to Amherst and joined that committee, like we always did have somebody from UMass Transit there, you know, from Five College Inc. Just for the perspective of like five college buses and things, but and PBTA, um, like we were visited PBTA, by right and. I mean, and we have a Doug Slaughter, who's like the town's rep on the PBTA board. I think for a while he was a chair, maybe he still is, but he's come and talked to TAC. Um, we do get requests, like we did have presentations from some people talking about West East Rail and things like that. So I suggest that maybe under the, the like, you know, the not delegated authority part, but that it includes something sort of related to those larger public transportation issues. Yeah. I mean, that was, that was always very useful. And honestly, you know, if we can get, and this is pie in the sky, of course, but getting someone who, you know, considering we have a major university right in the middle with that controls mainly their own streets, they're <laughs> right in the middle of our town, having someone yeah. from, who, also as part of the planning would be right. really useful. And I know that's pie in the sky, but yeah. yeah. Really talking more I mean, to one. Yeah, other, other than North Pleasant Street, we don't control their they can do whatever they want on their roads. I right. understand that, but like at least for planning sake, you know, right. and like network sake, it makes a lot of and and you know, I would imagine they would have the, you know there's a concern from them getting their people in and out of the of their space. Right. I mean, right. I mean, that was a large part of the conversation about Lincoln parking on Lincoln and whether it's commuter parking or whether it's not. And yeah. And there's so. just, you know, yeah. I, I don't so, know. So I, I have to log like, off in a couple of minutes yeah, to go no. to the affordable housing trust meeting. So this is great feedback. Um, so, can you if, tell if, us if, if you would like if anybody would like to write something and post you know if you think about something afterwards please write an email um okay. and i think we'll i'll go back to our you know our team and look at it again come up with it you know revise it i this is a great feedback i think um and um it's you said paul that it will go back to tso is that right no it, no, yeah okay. i learned today it was never okay. delegated to the That's tso what, it, okay it, the, t the council never gave it up. So all right, got it. So we'll go to, to the back. council, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, thanks. Okay. So, thank all right. You so much, um, yeah. Thank Great. you, Paul. Thank you. Um, wait, thank you just for before you just. Sure. And, well, okay. cool. No, I mean I can just conduct. I mean, just in terms of our next meeting, do we think we could meet like the beginning of August, like August first or eighth? I can also I can also send around an email. Sure. Gilford had said he's not available on the 15th or the 22nd. So I suggest we meet on the 1st or the 8th. So, and um, I can't meet um, in the latter part either. So I could do the 1st okay. or the 8th. I can okay. do the 1st. Okay. okay. I'll float that around in an email. So, um, Great. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you, Paul. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. 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 Have a good night.